Hi guys, welcome to Little Wicket Railway. I'm Rob and in this video, we're bringing the Hornby Level Crossing to life. This is the classic double track level crossing from Hornby and it's been around for decades. I'm pretty sure the only thing that's changed is the track used to be made from steel but now it's silver nickel. It's a key part of the Hornby track range and it does a pretty good job. You can choose to set it up with traditional gates as seen here and the gates can be opened and closed by hand or you can set it up with more modern half barriers and these black plastic representations for the lights. And again, you're able to manually raise and lower the barriers. That's pretty good, but in real life, level crossings are probably one of the most interesting parts of the railway, especially modern crossings with the flashing lights, the siren and the automatic barriers. Wouldn't it be better if we could pack all that excitement into this nearly 50 year old model? Well, good news, now we can, and it'll only cost around £20, and that's half the RRP of the crossing itself, so not bad value. We're going to add flashing lights, we're going to create the warning tones, and we'll use servos to motorise the barriers. Everything is going to be controlled by a single Arduino Nano, and I'll give you the step-by-step -step instructions for each section. Affiliate links to all the parts that I've used will be in the video description below, and I'll also share the code that I've used so you don't have to do any coding yourself. And you don't have to do every part of it, maybe you just want the lights or you just want the barriers to move, in which case you can just do those parts and skip over the rest. This isn't going to be super neat because it's not going on a layout just yet, it's more of a proof of concept. Before I got started on this project, I went down to a local level crossing to do some research on the closing sequence. And I've made a whole video about that, which you can find on the second channel. And I'll put a link to that up here. I'll be referring back to that research throughout the video. And that's what my code that controls the crossing will roughly be based on. But the nice thing with code is that you can very easily change it to make the sequence operate however you want it to work on your layout. Okay, let's get started. The controller for this project is going to be an unbranded Arduino Nano because it's cheap at less than £5 and it's small so easily hidden under the level crossing. And just to make my life slightly easier when it comes to connecting wires, I've plugged it into a screw terminal expansion board. The first thing we need is a way to tell the level crossing that a train is coming. And for this test project I'm using a simple on off rocker switch and I'm going to wire that between pin D4 and ground. Make sure the power is disconnected from the board before doing the wiring. If I was going to install this on a layout, I'd probably use a sensor that could automatically detect a train, such as a block occupancy current sensor. So the block would extend out either side of the crossing. When a train entered the block, the crossing barriers would come down, and when the train left, they'd go back up again. But for this test project, a simple on-off switch will do the trick. Now let's set up the hardware for the warning siren and this is the sound that we're going to try and replicate. It plays two tones which we'll generate using code later. It starts as soon as a train is detected and it continues to sound until the barriers are fully lowered before turning off. For the hardware, all we need is this little piezo buzzer, which costs around one pound, and a 220 ohm resistor that I've soldered onto the end of one of the leads. Instead of the fixed value resistor, you might want to consider a variable resistor with a dial so that you can adjust the volume once it's installed. But to keep things simple, I've just gone with a fixed value resistor. I'm going to connect the speaker to pins D3 and ground. In the video, you might be able to see that I've given it its own ground terminal, but later I decided to move it over to share the ground terminal that the switch is on because there were just too many ground wires. It doesn't matter which ground terminals used, they're both identical. And later you might also spot that I added a bit of heat shrink over the exposed solder connection around the resistor to prevent any accidental short circuits. Moving on to the lights, and this is what we're aiming to copy. There are four lighting units and each unit has three lamps. An amber lamp at the bottom which comes on at the start of the crossing close process, and two red lamps on top which briefly come on together before flashing alternately. 
The Hornby crossing comes with the light units molded in black plastic, so all we need to do is add in the lights, and for this we're using pre-wired LEDs. These are 0402 LEDs, and they measure about 1mm by 0.5mm, so they're absolutely tiny. You're going to need 4 orange and 8 red, and these should cost around £10 in total. We're going to need some glue to hold the LEDs in place, and I'm just using standard super glue, although they do tend to stay in place quite well even without glue. To make holes in the lighting units for the wires to pass through, I'm using a 0.6mm drill bit in my pin vise drill. So step one is to drill a hole in each of the lamps. I think it's best to position the hole towards the bottom of each lamp housing so that the wires are marginally lower down and there's a bigger space to glue the LED onto. Once you've got the holes, feed the tiny wires through and position the LED such that it naturally sits flat where the lamp should be. Then secure it in place with a dab of glue. Because the LEDs are so tiny, I found it easier to apply the glue to the rear of the LED with a pin rather than direct from the tube. And don't forget to have some paper towel nearby, just in case something goes wrong. Tweezers also came in really handy for positioning the LEDs and holding them in place whilst the glue set. On the units that attach to the barriers, the orange LED wires are going to come out where the unit connects to the barrier, which isn't ideal. To be able to route the wires, you'll need to cut a notch in the plastic just above the hole. And for this, I used a craft knife. Repeat this process for all 12 lights and you should end up with something like this. We can't wire them into the board just yet because we need to feed them through the level crossing first. To do this, I used a 1.5mm drill bit. There are already half-formed holes on the level crossing that are designed to hold the gates in place, and seeing as they're there already, I decided to use those. You need to do that in all four corners and then feed the wires for each lighting unit through. Now we need to add resistors onto each of the LEDs. I probably could have got away with some LEDs sharing resistors, but it's good practice to give each LED its own resistor. So I added a 220 ohm resistor to each of the positive legs. Here I fitted my components to a scrap piece of wood that's going to act as a temporary baseboard. Ignore the poorly lasered image of my dog to one side, that's nothing to do with this. I've drilled 10 millimeter holes in each corner under where the lamps will go to make it easy to fit the resistors through. So post the resistors and the wires through the right holes. And at this point, just to make your life a bit easier later on, you might want to mark the orange LED wires with a bit of tape or something to make them easy to identify once all the wires are under the board. Now the wiring for the lighting is a little bit complicated. In theory, we only need three outputs to control the lights. One output for the four orange LEDs, one output for the four right LEDs, and one output for the four left LEDs. However, each pin on the Arduino Nano can only handle a maximum current of 40 milliamps, so putting four LEDs on a single pin would probably overload it. So instead, we're going to use six pins and split them into pairs of LEDs. We'll split the orange LEDs between pins six and seven. We'll split the left red LEDs between pins eight and nine. And we'll split the right red LEDs between pins 10 and 11. So get the resistors paired up and start adding them to the screw terminals. There was just enough room to get the six pairs of resistors in place next to each other. So once all the red positive ends are screwed in, gather all the black grounds and they're all going to be connected to a communal ground pin. So to make life easier, I soldered all 12 together just to give the screw terminal something to bite into. Finally, we're going to animate the barriers using a couple of servos. The first thing you need to do is add a wire onto the collection of ground wires from the LEDs. This is because the ground connection on the Arduino and the ground connection for the servos need to be tied together, otherwise you'll get a lot of servo jitter. That's what I'm doing here. I've added a bit of heat shrink around all the wires and screwed it into the ground connection on the Arduino. We're going to use some very thin piano wire to move the barriers up and down. To attach the wire to the barrier, we first need to drill a small hole using the 0.6mm drill bit again. I drilled the hole where the red section ends closest to the pivot point. I thought this was a good compromise between keeping the mechanism discreet, but not putting too much strain on the servos. The wire I'm using is 0.5mm piano wire. It's strong enough to move the barrier, but still has some slight flex in it. Using some pliers, you need to bend a couple of millimetres at the end by 90 degrees, and this is what's going to hook into the barrier. We'll trim the wire to length later. 
Next, we need to drill a hole through the crossing for the wire to pass through. I'm using a 1.1 millimeter drill bit and I'm drilling the hole around 15 to 18 millimeters along the ridge that runs behind the barrier support. You might actually want to drill a few holes that overlap to create more of a slot to allow some sideways movement for the wire. The holes that I drilled for the wire didn't quite align with the holes that I've made in the baseboard, so, so maybe drilling larger holes in the baseboard might have been better. I'm roughly trimming the wires down to about two inches here and then reassembling the barrier unit with the wire in place just to make sure everything moves freely through the hole. Keep expanding the slot until the barrier can be moved easily. To power the servos you need a separate power supply and I'm using this variable power supply set to 5 volts. It's got a barrel connector on the end which connects to this terminal block with a plus 5 volts and ground connection. I've already connected the ground wire from the Arduino to the ground terminal and I've also got a ground and 5 volt wire with pins ready to plug into the servos. It's easiest to use a Y splitter for the two servos. The splitter allows us to control both servos simultaneously with only one set of inputs. Start by connecting the ground and 5 volt wires from the power supply into the input on the Y splitter. Then we need a signal wire. This is being connected to pin 5 on the Arduino and it goes into the signal input on the Y splitter. Then we can connect the servos to the Y splitter by simply plugging them in. I'm using two MG90 servos, they don't have to be MG90 servos, SG90 servos would do just fine. I just had these to hand and the only difference is that the MG90s have metal gears. One servo is already in place here on the baseboard and I'll show you how I connected the second one. It's a good idea to have already set the servos to position zero before installing if you've got a servo tester or maybe leave the servo horns off until you've uploaded the code. Otherwise, when the servos move for the first time, they could do some damage. Here I'm uploading the code so that I know the servos will be in the right position for the barriers to be up. I've also marked one side of the servo with tape so that I know which way the servos will move, i.e. up and away from the baseboard. We'll look at the code shortly. Note that the Nano is still getting its power supplied independently from the USB connection. The servos have their separate 5 volt supply and that's independent to the Nano's USB supply. So they're both powered separately and independently. I realized that I needed to relocate the speaker at this point to make installing the second servo easier. Then it's just a case of placing the servo such that the end of the servo horn aligns with the wire. I found that it worked better if I raised each servo up by a few millimeters using some offcuts of wood. Once the servo is positioned, then the wire can be trimmed to the right length and the tip bent so that it goes through the hole in the servo horn. And that's the servos installed. There are a few things you can fettle with to make sure the barriers get a full range of motion. You can either adjust the length of the wire, but ideally both wires should be identical in length. You can adjust the position of the horns on each servo, and in the code you can adjust how far the servos travel. But remember, this will impact both servos because we're using the splitter. Talking about the code, let's take a look at it in the Arduino IDE. I'm not going to spend too long on it now, I've tried to comment it so that it all makes sense. At the top we're pulling in the servo.h library and creating variables for the servo range of movement and variables for timers. We've also got a true false variable that will be triggered if a train is detected. Then we've got the setup section where we allocate all the pins. The buzzer is on pin 3, the train detection sensor is an input on pin 4, the servo is attached on pin 5, and then we've got the 6 pins being used for the LEDs. Recall that we're putting 2 LEDs on each pin, so we've got 3 pairs for orange, left reds and right reds. Then we've got the main code loop, which starts by setting the current time. We've got an if statement that's asking whether a train has been detected on pin 4. If the train is detected, then we start the close process. The first section of the close process just logs the time that the train was first detected. The next section manages the lights. For the first three seconds we have the amber lights on, then the amber lights go off and very briefly both red lights come on. Then after three and a half seconds the red lights flash alternately, changing every 330 milliseconds. The next section controls the barriers. After four and a half seconds the barriers start to come down, the speed can be adjusted using the servo delay variable at the top of the code. The final section is the alarm. This comes on when the train is detected and plays a tone on pin 3 at 784 hertz and 1046 hertz, swapping between the tones every 400 milliseconds. You can adjust these frequencies to be whatever tone you want. Then we move on to the section of code that's activated when no train is detected. The alarm is turned off immediately, 
The barriers are raised to the up position, the amber lights turn off immediately, and the red lights will turn off when the barriers are fully up. And then at the bottom, we've got a slight delay of 10 milliseconds before the main loop just repeats itself. Don't worry if you didn't follow that, just copy it and upload it. The only parts you might need to adjust are the variables at the top. Now it's time to give it a test and flick the switch. There we go, the buzzer, lights and barriers are all working. And if we flick the switch again, up they come and the lights are off. So it works, and obviously there's more you can do to hide the wires and make this all neater, such as gluing them to the posts and painting them black, but that's where I'm going to leave it, as this was just a proof of concept. Affiliate links to all the components, tools and code are in the description below. Hopefully you can agree that it brings life to the standard Hornby level crossing and makes it far more realistic and engaging. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Special thanks to all the YouTube members and patrons for your support. It's very much appreciated and your names are up on screen now. That's about it for this video. Thanks for watching and I will hopefully see you again soon.